training company. And um, what she quite rightly says, certainly in my experience, is, is it's all about people. Project delivery, companies, stakeholder management, it's all about people and personal relationships. And some work and work really well, and you become really effective, and others don't work so well. So um, I'd certainly be fascinated to, to, to get a, an insight into that. So I'll just hand over to you, Emma, if that's all right, and, and, and let you get going. Great. Thanks, Phil, for my introduction, and thank you all for joining me today for this webinar. So how do we get work done? How do projects reach successful conclusion, and how do businesses thrive through adversity? Many would offer answers such as having clear goals and plans, making sure everyone knows what their role is, and ensuring the business has great leadership, et cetera, et cetera. However, if you really stop to consider what makes a business successful, it has to be its people. People really are the backbone of any organization. And the way people work together is absolutely key to business success. Truly effective working relationships don't just happen. Because we work with so many different people, those we naturally relate to and those we really struggle to get. There are people who we are confident in to get the job done and those that no matter what, no matter how many times we've explained the task, you're still not getting the right result. So how do we create effective working relationships consistently? Well, at EMD Inspire, we have a three E's model to provide the foundations for effective working relationships. This model is based on the work of Daniel Goldman around emotional intelligence, Stephen Covey's seven habits, in particular the emotional bank account, and Peter Honey's understanding of dealing with problem people through owning expectations. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, I would like to share an overview of these three E's with you. And an overview is all we can achieve in the time we have, as in reality, we deliver one day workshops on each of these subjects alone. However, today my aim is to provide you with enough information for you to be able to make at least one change towards creating effective working relationships this week. So let's start. Our first E is all around emotional intelligence. Some of you may have heard of this already. Because in 1997, Daniel Goldman's book, Emotional Intelligence, hit the bookshelves and quickly became a number one bestseller. Over the last two decades, emotional intelligence has become recognized as a real defining factor in success, be that as a business leader or in your personal life. You quite possibly have heard of it or even attended a workshop on the elements. Emotional intelligence is an integral part of forming and developing meaningful relationships. There are significant links between high emotional intelligence and career success, interpersonal skills, and high levels of empathetic behavior. In fact, people who exhibit higher levels of emotional intelligence show you a greater ability to have a more balanced view of a situation, are able to cooperate with others, and whilst develop more affectionate and satisfying relationships. Now, of course, our IQ is important. However, it's not widely regarded that our IQ will progress us only so far in our lives and our careers, but our emotional intelligence is the absolute key to overall success. Just think about it. I'm sure we all know hugely intelligent, well-regarded individuals who seem really clumsy for one of a better word when it comes to people skills they can be socially distanced almost awkward in their approach and when it comes to empathizing with others well um spock from uh, star trek would absolutely spring to mind so daniel goldman identified five key elements to our emotional intelligence and these are self-awareness self-regulation social skills empathy and self-motivation. Let me explain a little bit more. Self-awareness is absolutely your ability, is your ability to recognize and understand your moods and emotions. Self-regulation is your ability to manage these disruptive emotions and adapt to changing circumstances. Those who are skilled in self-regulation excel in managing conflict, which all of us probably have experienced at work, adapt well to change and are more likely to take additional responsibility. 
Social skills is the ability to manage the emotions of others through an understanding and using this to build rapport and connect. Empathy is the ability to recognize and understand how others are feeling and consider those feelings before responding in social situations. Empathy allows you to understand the dynamics that influence relationships, both personal and in the workplace. And finally, self-motivation. This is all about a focus on achieving internal or self-gratification as opposed to being externally driven by praise or, or reward. Individuals who are able to motivate themselves in this way have a tendency to be more committed and goal focused. And the great news is that we can improve and build our emotional intelligence at any stage of our lives. So let me share a common situation that I'm sure many of us have experienced to help bring these intelligences to life. Let's talk about road rage. Have you experienced it? I know I have. Now, just to be clear, I've not been in the headlines after running people off the road with my road rage, but I know I've experienced the emotions from it. And our experience of road rage is a great way to help show how our emotional intelligence comes into effect or not. You see, we begin with self-awareness. When someone has cut you up, you can feel your anger building. You feel hot and you're perhaps holding that steering wheel a little bit tighter whilst you start pushing further on the accelerator pedal. If, you're in, if you let your emotional intelligence kick in, you begin to self-regulate. So you start to choose how you're responding to being cut up. You can choose to continue to be angry and show them just what you think of them in their rear view mirror, or perhaps you have passages. And so both social skills and empathy kick in because do you really want to upset everyone in the car and the children in the back? Do they really need to hear that type of language? And all of this is driven by our own self emotion. The choice to control and manage your response to the situation. Now, Sometimes we totally ignore our emotional intelligence and let our emotions take over. We definitely speed up behind that person. Perhaps we're even now giving a few hand gestures to teach them how to drive properly next time. And whilst all the time, the kids in the back of the car are learning a whole new set of words. I wonder which one you recognize in yourself. So recognizing how you respond to a situation like being cut up on the road and consciously choosing to do something about it positively is an emotional intelligence. In our face-to-face -face one day sessions, we'd invite you now to take some time to score yourself from one to five against each of these elements, with one being not great to five being excellent. Now I wonder how you'd rate yourselves on each of these elements. When we do this with teams of people, we also get everyone up positioning themselves along a line. It's really interesting to hear the challenge that each other give, each, give themselves based on their perception and what others in the team actually experience. Now you can choose to do this on a blank piece of paper after this webinar for yourself. And if you're able to explain the five elements to someone that knows you really well, get them to score you too because I wonder how aligned you would be, and it's a great start to work on your own emotional intelligence. But let me tell you a little bit more about them. When it comes to effective working relationships, there are four key elements that we see. They are self-awareness, self-regulation, social skills, and empathy. So firstly, self-awareness and self-regulation need to go hand in hand, but rarely do. When we have both of them working together, we are much more effective as an individual. Consider the calm and rational pilot despite losing the front wheel of his aircraft on takeoff. Or the surgeon who carries on with their duties despite losing a patient that day. And then consider the wider impact of both the pilot and the surgeon's behaviour on the people around them. Having high self-awareness and regulation in order to manage and control your emotional reactions means that you will be more rational in your decision making, calmer in your response and instill confidence and respect in those working with you. When it comes to effective relationships, it's much easier to work with someone who is able to manage their emotions calmly and respond to the ever-changing situations that are thrown at us at work. And then we have social skills. 
Human beings are sociable creatures. We like being connected to each other. The distance of the last few months have truly highlighted this. Gallup is an employee engagement company that actually has a question in their survey that asks if you have a best friend at work. It's also the one question that has the most divided views on whether a company should include it in their internal survey. But think about it. If we're social creatures, having friends at work is a natural um, thing we would want. We're social beings. And it's why Gallup asks the best friend question, because data gathered from that answer has shown a concrete link between having friends at work and the amount of effort employees expend on their job is increased. Our working relationships matter. With emotional intelligence, social skills is all about the human connection. It's our ability to listen, understand and read another person, not just through their words and tone, but the subtle communication clues we give through our body language and our gestures. Right now, we of course have an added level of complexity when it comes to social skills. Maybe we're still working remotely, or for some of us, we might be back in the office or on site, and we're having to wear face masks. This means I can't fully read someone's facial expressions or establish clearly their tone of voice, so I need harder to work harder to connect. Some of us are naturally good with our social skills and other of us need to work on them. You'll know which one you are. The final emotional intelligence I'm going to talk about is empathy. Empathy is the ability to sense and at some level understand other people's emotions. At work, it's probably the most avoided of all the elements and it really shouldn't be. In our one day workshop, we use a clip from the Disney film Inside Out to highlight the subtle differences between two characters trying to get someone to do the same task. Now, I can't share the clip right now, nor even ask you if you've seen the movie. So very briefly, let me explain. Inside Out is all about the emotions of one teenage child called Riley. The story plays out in her head where we meet the five emotions, fear, joy, disgust, anger and sadness. As the film progresses, there is one scene that demonstrates empathy so well, it highlights what we are getting wrong in business all the time. Because two of Riley's emotions, joy and sadness, are with a character called Bing Bong. Now hear me out here, because I totally get it, you weren't expecting to be hearing about a character called Bing Bong, but I promise it will lead to a real light bulb moment. Anyway, Bing Bong is the only person who knows how to get joy and sadness to the train station. And it really is important how they get there. However, Bing Bong has just experienced a very upsetting situation and is now sat crying. The first character, Joy, comes up to Bing Bong and tries to cajole him into action, saying things like, hey, it'll be all right. You'll feel okay soon. And grabbing his arm to pull him up, saying, we can talk about how you feel later. Now, which way to the train station? So think about this. Isn't this just what we do with our co-workers and our managers? We might notice someone isn't 100%. We might get that they're feeling emotional, and yet we don't fully engage in wanting to understand. We go into upbeat, positive messages and conjoling that person to keep going. In fact, we're more focused on the task, in this case, getting to the train station, than the person. In the film, Joy isn't successful in motivating Bing Bong into action. She wanders away. At the same time, Sadness sits next to Bing Bong and says, I'm sorry they took your rocket. That's something that you loved. And she listens while Bing Bong explains the adventures he'd had. She responds with, I bet you and Riley had great adventures and it sounds amazing. And after a short pause, she says, it's sad. While all the time, Joy is holding her head in her hands at sadness, apparently wasting this time. And yet within seconds of sadness, sitting and listening and empathizing with Bing Bong, he's up and able to direct them to the train station task back on track and bing bong felt understood and connected to the person that took the time to empathize. 
Now let's take this back to work. You don't deal with great big pink elephants in the pipeline industry. Well, not that I've been told anyway. But how often do we brush over another person's feelings and emotions for fear of upsetting them further, or in reality, a fear of it distracting from the task in hand? I mean, we don't deal with emotions. We don't have time for this around here, do we? That's mostly what we hear at work. So when you choose to empathize with another person, we're allowing them a level of understanding connection that enables us to move forward quicker and retains our mutual respect and trust in each other. Take a second or two now and look back on your own working relationships. How often have you been joy when the person really needed the strength shown by sadness? Now I'd like to make one thing clear. Whilst the character is called sadness, you don't need to feel or be sad to empathize with another person. It's the way the character chose to stop, to listen, to connect and say, I understand, I'm listening, that enabled the empathy to happen. So I bet you didn't think you'd be hearing about pink elephants in this webinar. How emotionally intelligent are you? As I shared earlier, you can do a quick self-assessment on each of the five elements by scoring yourself one to five and asking someone who knows you how well you did and share their view. There will be some areas you're okay in and others not so. There will also be days when no matter how good we are with all of this and how self-aware and self-regulating we can be, we choose not to be. Either way, understanding and working on our emotional intelligence is a key part of effective working relationships. So let's take a look at the second E in our 3E model, the emotional bank account. You may have heard of this term before, or perhaps it's new to you. I'd like to share a flavor of this concept and why it's important when it comes to effective working relationships. An emotional bank account is a metaphor used by Stephen King in his book, Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People. The metaphor of an emotional bank account describes the amount of trust that's been built up in a relationship. Having a high emotional bank account with others at work means our credibility is no longer an issue. We have enough deposits in each other's bank accounts so you and I know that we respect and value each other. We're able to focus on the issues at hand rather than personalities or vying for position. And because we trust each other, we're open. We put our cards freely on the table and there really is no games being played. And even if we see something differently, we know we'll be open to challenge and looking at the other point of view. Take this picture, for example. What do you see? Unfortunately, I can't have you actually share your opinions. But if I could, I'm sure many of you would answer, we see an old lady, to which others of you would exclaim, an old lady? What are you looking at? I see a young woman. Perhaps even now, a few of you are looking at the screen and thinking, I can't see either. If I were to probe a little and ask for your description of the woman, for example, where they were from, their age and the type of job they have, I'm sure, as we would have heard this before, I'm sure, as I've heard this before, that those of you who see the young woman see a woman perhaps in her 20s from Paris and her job would be something like a dancer. Of those of you that can see the older lady, perhaps you'd tell me you see a woman in her 80s, has worked on the land and perhaps from Russia. And still, there may be a few of you listening and looking at the screen thinking, what are you all talking about? I can't see either. But what you see in this picture is not the key point here. The fact is that at work, we will sometimes see the same thing in totally different ways. If our emotional bank account is high, then we are able to listen and understand each other's view. We're respectful of that view and we're committed to work together to find a shared outcome. Our emotional bank account is key to communicating in this way. So how do we build our emotional bank accounts with others? Much like our financial bank account, you need to make deposits in order to build up reserve. With your emotional bank account, these deposits are through being courteous, kind, honest, keeping commitments, being open, and apologizing when mistakes are made. It sounds all pretty obvious, 
but believe me, we don't do it enough. And in doing this, my trust towards you becomes higher. When we trust is high, communication is easy and effective. However, it's far too easy to put our emotional bank account into overdraft. If you have a habit of showing disrespect, maybe cutting, I cut you off in meetings, maybe I overact or even ignore you, Perhaps I've let you down in the past or avoid admitting my error. Eventually, my emotional bank account will be drained and I'm overdrawn with you. The trust between us now is really low and in turn, I have little flexibility. If I'm honest, our relationship is such that when we have to work together, I'm probably worth walking on eggshells. I'm measured in my conversation. There is obvious tension. We're definitely back to playing games and point scoring against each other. I'm protecting myself and I'm playing the game to my advantage and not for the wider team. Unfortunately, many relationships and organizations are like this. So what can be done to build your emotional bank account? According to Covey, there are six ways to make deposits and reduce withdrawals. They start with understanding the individual. This isn't just about getting to know someone. This means really listening with intent when the other person is speaking empathizing with how they feel. Think back to the picture of the woman I've just shared. If the person you were talking to sees it differently, take time to understand why and then share your point of view. It's important to offer care and consideration and act with kindness. The second way is to keep commitments. Again, it sounds really obvious, but how do you feel when someone arrives late to a meeting? or seems distracted when you're talking to them, or worse still, agrees to a deadline, then pushes it back or misses it completely. You see, keeping your commitments is a key factor in making continued deposits into someone's emotional bank account and in turn having effective working relationships. We need to make sure we're clarifying expectations. We are not mind readers, and yet we constantly expect others to know what we expect from them. The third E in our three E model, owning expectations, will shed more light on this. The fourth is to attend to the little things. These are the things that seem really simple and yet easy to forget. They're the things that when someone is, when a relationship isn't great, they become the big things, like a simple hello in the morning and how are you doing, a smile, a congratulations for some extra effort put in, or acknowledgement of the progress people have made so far doing something you didn't have to do just because you want to. All of these things build trust and add deposits into your bank account. Show personal integrity. Integrity is the moral floor upon which trusting relationships are built. When we operate with sound moral character, it makes it easy for others to trust us. Trust is fundamental in effective working relationships. And then finally, apologizing. We will make mistakes, it's part of life, we're only human. But when you make a mistake, or when you've let someone down, apologize sincerely. It's how you counteract the withdrawal from the emotional bank account. Think back to the situation with Bing Bong, when I talked about empathy. Sadness actually said, I'm sorry. She wasn't saying it was her fault because it wasn't, but she was empathizing with sorrow. Bing Bong felt and all the while building the reserve in his emotional bank account. Have a look at those six post-its on the screen now. Which one or two could you start working on now with others to build the relationship with them? So I've covered the first two E's in our three E model, emotional intelligence and emotional bank account. As I said, these are massive subjects alone, and I've really just given you a flavor. And now it's on to the final E, owning expectations. When our relationships at work and in general aren't great, we tend to point the finger towards the other person or people involved in the relationship it's easier to blame someone else than to reflect on ourselves. It tends always to be their fault as far as we're concerned. And we can be heard saying things like, it generally, it isn't my fault, it's all about them. Or I've tried everything. 
If it wasn't for them, this work would be done by now. Or worse, have you even tried working with them? They just don't get it. And alongside many seemingly rational reasons why they are to blame for this ineffective relationship. How often do we stop and consider the role we have played in creating the situation? The key to effective relationships is to remember when you point the finger towards the other person, there are three more fingers pointing back to you. So in essence, there's one finger pointing to them and three back at us. With this in mind, I'd like to offer you four potential reasons why our relationships may not be as effective as we thought. When we don't get on with someone, we tend to see them as the problem. Peter Honey shares four valid reasons as to why a person may be a problem for us. Firstly, the person doesn't know what you expect of them. Secondly, they haven't been told that they're not meeting your expectations. Then perhaps they can't actually meet your expectations. They don't have the skills and knowledge that you assume. And finally, maybe it's a simple that they do know what you expect of them, that they have been told they're not meeting your expectations and you've checked they've got the ability, but they're just not willing to do it. When we think of it like this, we can clearly see which three fingers are pointing back to us. We are responsible in ensuring that someone knows what we expect from them. We're not mind readers, so why should they be? If we don't clearly lay out our expectations of what we expect, how are they even going to come halfway to achieving them? Then if we don't provide feedback or gain understanding, then how will they know they're falling short? And worse still, we are all guilty of making assumptions, and this is worse when we assume someone's skill level. Just because they've been doing the job for years doesn't mean they have the skills and knowledge and cap capability of your expectations. I'm not saying this is about someone only doing a task the way you would do it, but it's about checking your associations and making it clear around the expectations and output you are expecting. So we now know that three of the reasons for ineffective working relationships sit with us. What about the finger pointing towards the other person? As the saying goes, you can only bring a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. So if you have been clear on your expectations, provided feedback on their progress, and ensure you have, they have the skills, knowledge, and capability to complete the task, then it boils down to their own lack of willingness. And this is a whole different training session for me to deliver. Let me bring it to life for you. I'd like to introduce you to Bob and Mo. These guys have just begun working together in business, renovating houses. They've known each other for a while as they've worked on various building sites across the UK, yet this is their first venture together. On this particular day, Bob in the red cap has been left to install a new banister whilst Mo goes off to collect supplies. Now I'm pretty sure the conversation went something like this. Right Bob, I'm off to get supplies. You okay to get the banister up? Uh-huh, comes a reply from Bob and off Mo goes. A few hours later, Mo returns and Bob is packing his tools in the van. Job done. Good day's work. Mo pops into the house to drop off the supplies for tomorrow and sees the banister is up. Seriously? Let's just break this down a minute. Mo has walked into the house and sees the job that Bob has done. Now, I wonder how emotionally intelligent Mo is feeling right now. Then let's layer on how strong or not their emotional bank account is, and you have the start of the finger point. If Mo chooses to lean into the unhateful emotions rather than self-regulate, and let's say this isn't the first time Bob's got something wrong, so their emotional bank account is low, then he's not going to be able to take a step back to consider the situation calmly and rationally, and the finger pointing is begun, with no consideration for the three fingers pointing back at him. How effective is this working relationship right now and in the future? But what if Mo was able to regulate his emotions? If there is a high regard for each other through a solid emotional bank account, 
then perhaps Mo would take a step back and review the three fingers pointing back at him. He'd think back to the conversation that morning. Was he clear in what he expected? Did he check Bob understood? And also, has he got the cap capability to meet those expectations? Or was their whole conversation based on assumptions? So, how can we have more effective working relationships? For us at EMD Inspire, our 3E model is a great foundation. Start by understanding and building your emotional intelligence. Build in the reserves in your emotional bank accounts with others and take ownerships of the expectations in your relationships. And you will be creating solid foundations for effective working relationships. It's really up to us to work with the 3Es. I hope over the last 30 minutes, I've been able to provide some insight into each of these areas. As I said at the beginning, we would usually deliver a whole day on this topic alone. So for now, I hope I've left you with a flavor and some tools you can take away to at least make one or two changes today. Thank you for listening, and I hope it's been a useful half hour. Thanks, Emma. That was uh, really brilliant. I th thoroughly uh, enjoyed that. It's only made me think. Um, just. Run through some questions if you've got a few minutes. Um, obviously, the flu pandemic's forced a lot of us to work from home, and, and there's a, a, an awful lot written about the future of the office and the office environment. And it's just getting your feel for the impact that will have on human relationships, really, and, um, and, and training youngsters and nurturing. And, and I, I, what are your thoughts from your perspective on, on that area? I think it definitely lends itself to Peter Honey's model, the finger point. If you think about it, we're working remotely. So we have to, first of all, check our own assumptions of what we've told that person to be doing. Have we absolutely set out the expectations? Have we provided the clarity of what the output's gonna look like? Because when you're working remotely, you have to rely on that person being able to get on it on their own. They don't want you checking in all the time. You know, we, we talked about Phil earlier, you know, working from home has its own set of challenges, you know, the cat walking in and all that kind of stuff. So you need to be clear and take ownership of, have I give clear clarity? Have I checked understanding? Am I giving feedback? And have I made sure they have the capability to do what I'm asking? And if you've got all those things in place, then it doesn't matter where that person's working, they should be able to get the task done. Okay. Um... I mean, it, it's 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 the empathy things. It's spotting how people are, and um, it's, it's the behaviour, the way they walk to the coffee machine, whether they've got a spring in the step, or whether um, they, they haven't. I, I think there will be quite a lot that we'll lose if we're not careful. Yeah, I think that, and I think that's the challenge. Where you know, going back to what I said around, you know, our typical response as managers of people is to come at it from a joy perspective. We're all about cajoling the positive messages, getting people really boosted up. But I think when people are working remotely, it's even more important to have one-to-ones, to have that moment where I've just dialed in and I'm having a FaceTime with just one person, not the whole team. And whilst that yes. takes more time, that's when you're going to understand exactly how is this person feeling? You know, what emotional state are they in? You're not going to get that on a team meeting. So um, I think it is, again, it's back to us, particularly if we're managers, to make more time to connect with people remotely than we ever had have before. Because to your point, you know, in the past, we've been able to see someone walk down the office and get a judge on what they're feeling that day. Yeah. You're not going to see that. So that has to come from us making more time to speak to each other, to, fit, to connect as much as we can whilst remote. Okay. Got a question from uh, Mr. McNulty. Um, is empathy an intrinsic characteristic or can it be taught? It absolutely can be taught. However, there are some people who are naturally more empathetic than others. Um, so there's tools like um, the Myers-Briggs personality indicator. You may or may not have come across it before mm -hmm. and insight colors. They help us understand whether we have a level of empathy and how high that is. We all have empathy, yet for some of us, we have to work at it. We absolutely have to work at it. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely people do vary in my experience. There's, a, there's a, another one from Chris to everybody. You mentioned the word trust several times. From work I've done with the Industrial Society and the Workplace Foundation, one of the most important traits of great leaders is to build effective relationships on trust. How important is the skill in your view? That's from Chris Bielby. Huge. I mean, 
you mm. know, we know if I don't fundamentally trust someone, how am I going to respond to a request or response uh, a situation from that person? I'm going to have skepticism. I'm going to be challenging. I'm going to make my own assumptions on what they really mean if I don't genuinely trust that person. And this absolutely links to the work of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits and the Emotional Bank Account. You know, if I haven't got a great foundation, if I haven't got trust with someone, I'm going to be really challenging in, you know, how I deal with them. I'm going to question their intent you know have they got my best interest at heart in what they're wanting to get done so trust is absolutely critical when it comes to working relationships couldn't agree more emma i think that was brilliant and uh, there's there's quite a lot of feedback to that effect there is another question just coming from from leon the current situation is making building relationships with uh, potential clients very difficult it would be great to create empathy from the outside of our own business too uh, i think I'm not sure what the question is there, but it, it certainly, as we mentioned before the seminar started, a, a lot of our industry is about managing stakeholders yeah. and, and people outside the business. I and, think the one uh, thing I could offer for that, the easiest way to build empathy with others when you haven't got an immediate connection with them, so you might be meeting for a first time, it might be someone you want to sell to, or it's even a supplier that you need to buy from, is get interested in them. Ask yeah. about them. Spend as much time knowing them. And once you've got that going, they then know you are genuinely interested in them. That's how you build the empathy connection. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, th I think we'll have to call it a day there because we're running out of time. But I, I could yeah. talk to you all, all day about this sort of thing. I think it's fascinating. I think that's Thanks been for having me, Phil. Really, really good. And the, the feedback is certainly coming through to that extent. So, brilliant. Just before a goal, just a quick reminder, on the 18th of August, we've got Digging Up Britain, and that is the line search before you dig and the 2.8 million inquiries that they get and what we can learn from that. So that's a Fisher German presentation. And it's really interesting, not one I've really thought about, to be honest, so I'll be calling into that one. 20th of August, we've got a uh, Dr. Tolly Balance talking about um, the, the, the future of gas and um, how that's going to go green. And um, that's a fascinating area at the moment. And... Tony Job Balance has got his Chief Strategy and Regulation Officer for Gaiden, so um, that, that'll be extremely interesting to, to get his view on that. Then we've got Tata Steel on the 25th of August talking about how they're going to you know, green up steel and steel pipe production and, and their pathway to net zero, which again, every, every industry will have its own perspective and its own challenges in this respect. So that, that's um, an, another fascinating one. Um, and then we've got others on the 1st of September, the 3rd of September, and um, so, so, so look it up on the, the, the Guild website. Um, so I, I think that, that's brilliant. I think we're getting some very positive feedback. That I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for coming on board. We had 40 participants, which is excellent. And, um, so thanks, Emma. And um, we will look forward to seeing everybody at the next seminar. Thank you.